Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Fellowship. Um, let's get on to our, our teacher for today. So uh, I'll introduce Dorothy Hunt. She serves as a spiritual director of the Moon Mountain Sangha, um, teaching at the request of Adi Ashanti. She's the founder of the San Francisco Center for Meditation and Psychotherapy and practiced psychotherapy from 1967 to 2020 just recently closing the practice. Dorothy has a long and deep connection to the teachings of Ramana Maharshi and the path of self-inquiry, as well as the non-dual teachings of Zen, Advaita, and Christian mystics. She's the author of many books. I'm going to post in the chat um, a link to her um, bibliography, or that's not the right word. Um, most recently, Ending the Search for Spiritual Ambition to the Heart of Awareness, a uh, some poems and reflections in the books Only This and Leaves from Moon Mountain. And she was a contributing author of The Sacred Mirror, uh, Non-Dual Wisdom and Psychotherapy, Volumes 1 and 2. And she also offers satsang retreats and private meetings in the Bay Area and elsewhere by invitation. Um, I think her satsang is meeting this Wednesday, so you can check that out. I put the link in there. And um, she also has, is a YouTuber, so if you, YouTube is your thing, you can check that out, too. Anyway, welcome, Dorothy. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you again. Um, and, yeah, I'll, I'll, almost all of the offerings I have, um, as yours as well, are online these days because of uh, COVID. But... We don't know, do we, when that uh, might open up and we could be with each other uh, in person once again. <clears throat> when I um, knew I was going to be speaking to you all, uh, a Buddhist group, uh, I, I got down one of the volumes of Dogen's Treasury of the True Dharma I, and uh, he's one of my favorite Buddhist teachers. Um, not so much what he spoke about in terms of life in the, in the monastery and what toothbrushes to use and the details and so forth, but the profound and unbelievably uh, deeply understood truths that he points to so eloquently. Anyway, I just opened the book to any page and, and um, thought I would take my inspiration from Dogen today. And so I opened to uh, a talk that's called the manifestation of great Prajna, the manifestation of great Prajna. Um, and, and, and Dogen's understanding of, of Prajna is so, so deep and so widespread. And there's no way we really can talk about it as a concept, although we're going to use words. I'm going to use words to try to point. Um, but I want to invite us all in, uh, in a little while to have some experiential uh, times uh, with our senses to discover perhaps or to deepen our experience of the functioning of prajna. Prajna is this uh, wisdom beyond wisdom, this wisdom that isn't uh, acquired. It's not in, of the intellect. It's not of the will. It's the wisdom of life as it is, in a sense. It's, uh, it's the wisdom that is the wisdom of the knowledge of emptiness. And by emptiness, we don't mean nothingness, do we? It's the empty, it's this mystery that's empty of definition, really. It's empty of division. It's empty of self. It's empty of a dualistic view. It doesn't mean uh, that there isn't the dualistic view that our minds have in this relative world, this relative life, but there's a way of seeing that's not separate. 
and um and it's functioning it's functioning all the time this this wisdom that is called in the buddhist tradition prajna it's it's heart wisdom it's not just the wisdom of emptiness but also its function which is the function of compassion and oneness intimacy love that sort of thing so i want to use uh, as kind of a skeleton maybe the the background for our conversation and our exploration today uh dogen's words so i want to just read a bit from those um and it begins like this avalokiteshvara bodhisattva while experiencing deeply the manifestation of prajna wisdom beyond wisdom clearly saw with the entire body with the entire body that all five skandhas are empty these five skandhas or streams of body and mind form feeling perception inclination and discernment are fivefold prajna clear seeing is prajna to expound this teaching it is said in the maha prajna paramita heart sutra that form is emptiness and emptiness is form form is form emptiness is emptiness boundlessness 100 grasses are thus myriad forms are thus um and later he he says the entire body is prajna the entire other is prajna the entire self is prajna the entire east west south and north is prajna so we're talking about this mystery that's boundless that is everything every moment is it's operating whether we actualize that or realize that depends on how much we're living in our mind of concepts and how much we're not doesn't mean concepts are wrong ideas are wrong but there's a way of seeing um that all of us have have experienced whether we call it that or not but there's a way of seeing without that division of a concept an idea a judgment and so forth so when you're looking or listening or tasting or touching uh without that division this is the manifestation of of great prajna the great part the maha part means there's no there's no outside nothing outside but also there'd be nothing inside you know so we 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 can't really try to make a concept of it but these are words that are uh hoping to point beyond themselves so this um talk he gave in 1233 as a matter of fact it goes on he said the ma- the manifestation of the 12 fold prajna the prajna of the six senses and their objects means 12 types of entering into buddha dharma this is our life this is our everyday experience of the six senses right and you know it's it be the the seeing and the seen and the and the seer just collapse because then he goes on to talk about there's the 18 fold prajna the prajna of eyes ears nose tongue body and mind the prajna of sight sound smell taste touch and objects of mind and also the prajna of the corresponding consciousness of eyes ears nose tongue body mind so we have all of these ways of living our life you know the, this is our life we 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 imagine there's a separate seer but is there really we imagine there's a something separate from the seer which is the seen subject object then there's something that's conscious of this of what we think of as a separate seer the separate object that's seen and that which is conscious of all of it So what I want to invite us to do is is to see what it would be feel like to collapse those things that we may think of as separate but in terms of the wisdom of prajna the wisdom that is prajna they're not three things you know the the ear the listening and what's heard are not three things only the mind that labels it only the mind that tries to make distinctions uh will divide the world that way so i want to just invite us uh to use three of the senses 
um, to explore, experiment a bit. And the first one is, is just, I'm going to invite you to, um, to look at anything in the room where you are. Anything at all. Just, just pick one thing to focus your attention on. And imagine that you're seeing it as though for the first time. Now, you may have a a label, a name that will arise, but let that just go in the background. Because now we're just inviting ourselves to see without a division. To see freshly. Beginner's mind, as uh, Suzuki Roshi would say, you know, it's like um, a child, that, a baby that might see something for the first time is fascinated with it, doesn't have a name for it, doesn't know if it should like it or dislike it, no judgments, just the fascination with seeing without separation. So let yourself Just experience seeing whatever you've chosen in this very, very intimate way. Where we're not talking about what we're seeing. We're not even imagining that there's something separate that's seeing. Just at one, totally at one, to whatever extent it's possible. Totally at one. Because the seeing itself has no division to it. That which is aware of the seeing is not divided from the seen or the seeing or an imagined seer. So just in Inviting us to receive what's here with the whole body, as Dogen said. Someone sees with the entire body. That means taking it in from this perspective of wholeness, of intimacy, of now. Any ideas we have or names we have, those are from the past. What's it like to look at this, whatever it is, without a name? Just clear seeing. What's the experience when the ideas and the judgments and the labels just move to the background or dissolve altogether, collapse into the moment, just this moment, this as it is? And so now I want to invite, uh, invite us all to the experience of touch. And so it is uh, more easily facilitated by closing your eyes. And, and just let yourself touch anything. Could be, you know, you could have one hand touching the other. Or you could touch the cushion that you're sitting on. You could touch something smooth in front of you, the computer, whatever. But let yourself have this full, complete experience of touch. Without needing to know what you're touching. Just touch.
No separation. No separate somebody touching, just the touching, just the experience. Now. The mind may come up with ideas of liking or disliking or trying to figure out about the texture or the bumps or the smoothness. But let that all go into the background and simply experience without the words this moment of touching. And you may just notice how sensitive that touch becomes when you're not focusing on your ideas about it, your words about it, your judgments, liking or disliking. Just this intimate, sensitive touch. Wholeness touching itself. Through you as you, no separation, just this moment. And just feel how much more the experience feels intimate to you in the absence of concepts, ideas. Ideas about a self. Ideas about an object. All of that collapsing into just this moment of touch. And now I'm going to invite us just to listening to another way of entering Buddha Dharma through listening. Listen with your whole body. And in this talk, Dogen recited a, a poem from his teacher, Ru Jing. My late teacher, he says, old Buddha said, the entire body is a mouth, a wind bell hanging in empty space. Regardless of the wind from the east, west, south, or north, joining the whole universe in chiming out prajna. Ting, 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 ting. 
See if you can get a sense of this entire body. This is the wholeness of you. A wind bell hanging in empty space, chiming out moment to moment. What is? And you, you are that. You are the chiming. You are the space in which it's happening. And those are not separate. The form, the formless, not two. Okay. (laughs) Well, any of those little experiential things could have gone on longer. But I'd love to stop uh, just for a few moments anyway and, and hear from any of you what any one of those might have been like for you to uh, attempt to listen or to, to touch or to see something without dividing a self, a subject and an object. Were any of you able to have that experience even for a moment? Mm-hmm, maybe, maybe. <laughs> Tell me about it, Chris. Well, that that was certainly like a a very quick. Um, you brought me right into a very meditative space. Um, it felt a little bit like an LSD trip, probably. Really, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it was that was beautiful. I there's a little bit uh, commotion going on upstairs, so I'm getting pulled into that um, for my neighbors. But uh, so I was kind of going back and forth with that. And what kind of came up for me was like. Yeah, this feels great, but what about working in the world? And that sort of came up for a moment for me, and then I got back into the, the space of it. I'm much more of a, um, I can respond more to the sound than I can do a visual for me. Mm-hmm. Visual pulls in stuff where I start to, I feel like I dissociate some when I'm looking as opposed to just listening. Um, but thank you, that was interesting. Mm, good. Well, one thing about the, the visual, um, I mean, we're so used to, uh, naming objects that we're seeing and having ideas and judgments about them and so forth and so on. But, but one of the things that, that can be helpful in terms of seeing from this deeper place in ourselves is to let yourself receive what you see instead of going out after it. It's a very different, it's more like listening that way, right? Right, right. In fact, I appreciate listening to certain forms of music, like classical music that way, is just sort of yeah. be there with but yeah, as opposed to holding on to it. That's very true. Exactly. Because generally I want to sort of reach and pull and figure out right away. Right, right, right. Yeah. Anything, anyone else have a comment they would share with us? You want to say something? I'm, yeah, uh, fun. Yeah, that was very, um, yeah, I, again, I also felt like visual was, there was more intrusion of concepts and separateness and, um, and, um, but, it, you know, in, in some ways, it was like, um, yeah, kind of like this expanding and then all of a sudden it would contract the experience and, and, and the intrusion. And it's kind of sometimes when I got to the edge of that expansion, that boundlessness, there, were, it's the same thing as when I'm meditating, this fear comes in mm-hmm. of kind of losing myself. Exactly. So I try to just breathe through that and be with that and then continue. Um, so it's very frustrating though, that fear that comes in. Well, it's understandable. I think when we get to that edge, uh, the mind has a lot of fear because we're so used to identifying a self with just uh, this limitation of self. Do you know, this one physical, mental body, this body-mind. Uh, but when you feel into that boundlessness, that the empty space, and by that I don't mean nothing. I mean th- this that's empty of a definition, this this Buddha nature we could call it, but it's not the name. Do, do you know, it includes this body, <laughs> this physical body. It includes this 
mind. It includes these moments of thinking and feeling and touching and tasting and so forth and having whatever thoughts we have about it. It includes, it includes everything because it's our life. Do you know, our life is this, but you know, it takes a little bit of uh, courage, you know, and a little bit of curiosity or a lot of curiosity to see what is it like to let go into that boundlessness. And I mean, I know in my own experience, you know, with meditation many years ago, every time I would get to that edge, it would feel like I was about to jump off a cliff and I would, I would call out to every God I knew to save me. You know, this is like Jesus, Buddha, Shiva, they all can, oh, please save me, save me. You know, and, 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 and we can feel just how much, um, identification we have, but, The question I would ask is who or what is identifying with this body mind? Do you see? I mean, it's only from the perspective of separation that we imagine that the boundlessness is not itself identified with its own manifestation of tree, of bird, of fish, of human, of this moment. Do you know? So a bigger view, you know? what actually is in a sense loving its own expression so much that it's not not separate from it it's identified with it and yet you know it also is so much more and and so much less than that identification yeah go ahead uh christian is that right yes yes yeah i'd just like to say thank you very much dorothy that was um well on a very sort of basic level, it was very relaxing. I, I really appreciated that. And, um, right sort of immediately afterwards, I, earlier this morning, I was a little bit, um, a little bit worried, I suppose is the word about a, uh, negotiation I have to be involved in a little bit later today. And I notice now that I feel much less offended than than I did before your talk. And, and that feels really good. Good. Feels like I have less to defend. (laughs) There's a part in this talk that Dogen gives where, uh, uh, someone, well, let me, I'll, I'll just go back just a little bit. Uh, Indra supposedly asks Sabuti, who's, uh, an elder, Buddha elder, uh, He said, if, if one wants to experience this profound manifestation of prajna, how should they study? Uh, and Sabuti says, Lord Indra, if bodhisattvas, great beings, want to experience the profound manifestation of prajna, they should study as they would study empty space. Thus, studying prajna is empty space. Empty space is studying prajna. And, you know, we could stop for a moment. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to get to why I, I want to read the next thing to you, Christian, and all the rest of us. But if you were just to stop for a moment and study empty space right here and now, what would you notice about empty space? Studying prajna is studying empty space. Empty space is studying prajna. Isn't that which is aware in all of us empty until it lights on something, but it includes anything and everything? The empty space of our original mind. You see, there's the mind of space, we could say, and that's what we're pointing to in terms of, of, non, of a non-dual perspective of non-separation. Um, of boundlessness, that's the mind of space, the awake mind of space. And then there's the mind in space, <laughs> the mind that's trying to come up with uh, experience of, of peace, for instance, by concentration or, or by whatever means we have of, of our meditation practice or other practices. So the mind of space and the mind in space, we might think of as, well, those are really separate. But they're not, because that's the, that's the, that's what we come to. That realization, that form, 
is form, emptiness is emptiness, form is emptiness, emptiness is form, you know, um, not separate, not two. So when you know in whatever, in, in whatever ways it reveals itself to you, when you know that you are that, you are that which is boundless, as well as what is, it, what is not boundless, do you know? But this that's limited is just an expression of what's unlimited. So anyway, about uh, the protection piece, back to you, Christian. Not feeling so defended. Okay. So after, after this little interlude about studying, uh, Prajna is studying empty space. So then, um, Indra asks, well, if, 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 if good men and women, uh, receive, recite, reflect upon, explain to others the profound manifestation of Prajna that you have explained, how should I protect them? Please tell me. And then Sabuti asks Indra, do you think there's anything you need to protect? And Indra said, no, great reverend. I don't see anything I need to protect. And so this is, this is seeing from that deeper perspective, isn't it? Do you know? In our human experience, yeah, it feels like there's a, a need to protect the body or protect our views or protect our religion or whatever it is. But then in this that's boundless, in this emptiness that doesn't pick and choose what's here, but is simply open, accepting, seeing, but also manifesting as all of it. Maybe there's nothing to protect uh, as well as, yes, there are, there will be protection happening, you know, or not, depending, because life is as it is. Um, Thank you. That's, that's helpful. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Good. I mean, the more, the more this kind of realization and not, not an intellectual one, but, you know, your own experience of this, that's a mystery. The more that's working in the system, the fewer defenses we, we have. Doesn't mean they are not ever going to come. Um, but we, we begin to feel much more accepting of life as it is, you know, including birth, life and death. You know, they're all, they're all here as well as no birth <laughs> and no death, you know, and, and the mind says, well, it's either one or the other, but you know, as the Heart Sutra says, you know, no old age, suffering and death and no end to old age, suffering and death. This is the middle way. We're not trying to have just an transcendent experience. Well, let me let me find nirvana and stay there forever. You know, let me have only blissful experiences. No, life is whole. It's all of it. It's it's the whole the whole thing. And this this idea uh, of, of how the, how prajna functions, it feels like it's down to the very details of our life. If, if we have eyes to see, like, um, last night I was in bed, you know, trying to go to sleep and I, you know, my nightgown was bunched up and I, the body turned and I pulled my nightgown down and da da da, you know, it's like, but all that just happened. And I thought, that's, that's the function of prajna. That's the wisdom that just knew what to do. I wasn't thinking, oh, you should do this. You should do that. I wonder where, how I'm going to be more comfortable. It just happened. Or, or this morning in the shower, I'm watching the water rivulets just walk, you know, come down the shower door. You know, it's really a beautiful uh, pattern if we take time to actually be intimate with it. And, you know, in this um, talk, Dogen says, there's the sixfold great element prajna, earth, water, fire, air, space, and consciousness. And I'm thinking, you know, like, and I'm not thinking, it's just sort of coming, but, you know, this is earth, gravity. This is water responding to gravity. It's going down. It's not going up. And yet in geysers, there's so much pressure, the water's going up. So the prajna of water, the prajna of earth. And then he, he, he talks about, he said, then there's the fourfold bodily posture prajna. 
walking, standing, sitting, and lying down, common in daily activities. So these are, these are our daily activities, you know? And those of us with knee braces may be having trouble walking. <laughs> I hope you're healed soon, my friend. But, um, but yet, you know, all of these things, it's, it's pretty wondrous, really amazing how this wisdom just operates. And, you know, we'd like to think when we're coming from the mind that wisdom only looks a certain way. But, as you know, life is based on causes and conditions. And from my perspective, those causes and conditions go back to beginningless time. You know, everything interconnected because of this, that, because of that, this, and so forth, and so on, and so on. And so when you really understand the emptiness of all those things, you know, then there's freedom. It doesn't mean they don't continue. Karma continues. But but there's also a freedom in knowing that it isn't personal. There's no separate somebody who's here, you know, being punished or being rewarded. That's what the mind will add. But no, causes and conditions just move. Life just moves. Some places in the city right now, it's foggy. Where I live, it's still foggy. You know, where some of you are, it's sunny, you know, causes and conditions. Um, and they don't have a separate self. There's no separate identity there. And so it makes it possible to feel so much freedom in the moment as it is. Do you know, even if what we're not being separate from is anger in the moment, for instance, you know, oh, anger is not part of blah, 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 but it arises, doesn't it? So what's it like? not to try to push it away, but to be in a sense now and not to manifest it as I'm going to, you know, harm somebody or harm yourself. But what's it like to actually be intimate with it in the way that maybe you were intimate with the, with the wind bell, you know, or, or with the music that you listen to? What if you brought it in, in such a way, you know, the Buddha said, take care of anger as it, if it were your only child. Because he was using this experience of a mother and child, you know, the mother just cares for the child. You know, there's no, there's no thought um, necessarily. <laughs> not that as a mother, you don't have a lot of thoughts about what might be good or not so good in caring for a child. But, but immediately, the immediate thing, your, your, your kid is crying. There's a need. You pick up, you pick up the baby. Do you know, you're not thinking about should I? And, and, and more and more as prajna is functioning, as it, as it's, your innate wisdom is functioning, you know, there will be less and less gap between the moment and what's the response to the moment. You know, I want me, should I, shouldn't I? Is this right? Is this wrong? What will they think? La di da da da. It's not, it's not about all of that. That's that comes from our self consciousness when we think there's a separate self to protect or or to create some identity that will be pleasing to another and so forth and so on. But what's spontaneous? You know, I, I was recalling um, yesterday a moment with my teacher Ajishanti. Many many years ago, I was down in San Diego. <clears throat> at the an inner directions conference there and he, he was a speaker and it was before there were hundreds of people there. It was before people were going into the auditorium and there was some uh, bug on the ground. It must've been a bug I liked because, <laughs> because uh, I was drawn to it and I was a little concerned about, you know, is it going to be stepped on and what should I do? And, Da da da, how should I protect it? Blah blah blah. I was thinking all these things. And I was I was there with Adyashanti and I spoke to him about, and I pointed out this bug or butterfly or whatever it was on the ground. And I was concerned about it. And and there wasn't a moment between his seeing that bug and picking it up 
fragile thing that it was and taking it to the window. I mean, it was just like that. It wasn't about should I or shouldn't I, which is where I was at that time. You know, it was this spontaneous movement of compassion, really. And that's, that's why Prajna is, is the, is heart wisdom. It's, it's this compassion and love that if you know you are the one, you are the one mind. You are the essence of mind, the essence of heart. You are that. Well, then you take care of that. And if we knew, if more of us consciously knew that the earth was ourself, I think we would take different care of it, don't you think? Or if, if we knew that, that as, as Dogen says, the entire body is prajna, the entire other is prajna, the entire self is prajna, the entire east, west, south, and north is prajna. Um, and it's the manifestation of the Buddha. He says, the Buddha, the world honored one, is the manifestation of prajna. The manifestation of prajna is all things. All things are aspects of emptiness. Not arising, beyond arising, not perishing, not defiled, not pure, not increasing, not decreasing. And yet, of course, all of those things appear to happen, don't they? Um, to actualize the manifestation of prajna is to actualize the Buddha, the world honored one. Look into this. Study this. To dedicate yourself and take refuge in the manifestation of prajna is to see and uphold the Buddha. It is to be the Buddha, the world honored one, seeing and accepting. Because when you are the mind of space, the the mind of emptiness, of not clinging, pushing away, deciding this should be here and this shouldn't be here, and so forth and so on. When you are the mind of space, there is this clear seeing and accepting. And it doesn't mean that the accepting won't lead to the function of compassion. You know, this is where action, action comes, you know. The empty space, we might say, appears to be quite passive, right? But its function is action. Your action and mine. Do you know? Your action in the moment. What wants to come through you in any given moment? What's your response? What's your wisdom? Your innate wisdom. Not the wisdom that you're going to think about. But what's the wisdom that wants to just come forth when you're not being separate? So I'm going to just um, end with uh, a little bit more of Dogen. And you're familiar with this, I'm sure, actualizing the fundamental point. As all things are Buddha Dharma, there is delusion, realization, practice, birth, life, and death, Buddhas, and sentient beings. As myriad things are without an abiding self, there is no delusion, no realization, no Buddha, no sentient being, no birth, no death. The Buddha way, in essence, is leaping clear of abundance and lack. Thus, there is birth and death, delusion and realization, sentient beings and Buddhas. Yet in attachment, blossoms fall and aversion leads spread. And then... One of my favorite Dogen lines. Those who have great realization of delusion are Buddhas. Great realization of delusion are Buddhas. Those who are greatly deluded about realization are sentient beings. Further, there are those who continue realizing beyond realization and those who are in delusion throughout delusion. When Buddhas are truly Buddhas, they do not necessarily notice that they are Buddhas. So those people proclaiming something are not necessarily the ones who are quietly, intimately, and profoundly actualizing our Buddha nature. So thank you so much for your attention. I think it's time. Is that right? Yeah. And um, it's a, a pleasure to be with you this morning and to share uh, 
a bit more of Dogen. Many of you may be familiar with what I was speaking about today, but it's always a challenge um, for somebody who's not, I don't consider myself a you know, Buddhist teacher to open open a book and say, okay, this is what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> this is what we're going to point to. So anyway, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dorothy, very much. You're Love welcome. Talk. All right, and then now it's time for announcements. Um, I'd like to just make a pitch for Donna. Donna is the Pali word for generosity. Uh, when you give to this Sangha, you help us um, contribute to the teacher honorariums, to our work, uh, our, our publication and distribution of newsletters to incarcerated Buddhists and, and members of GBF around the globe. Um, and we're uh, sort of keeping a reserve because when we go back to Bartlett Street, we hope to um, create, make it a live streaming event so that people can continue to zoom in and, um, and come in person to, to their, to their choice. So please give what you can. Um, uh, a donation of 10 or $20 really helps. And there's a link you click it and it takes you right to um, the PayPal link. You can do that now. Um, any other announcements? Okay. Um, don't see any hands or uh, anyone unmuting. Um, also, a reminder that Wednesday we have another Gay, Gay Buddhist Fellowship has another sit on Wednesday evenings at seven thirty. It's the same link. You can go to the, to the website. Um, and then next week is uh, there is not a teacher, but it will be an open discussion. Um, so come again next week for a small group open discussion. And if there are no other announcements, we will. Um, do our dedication of merit. And then Dorothy, do you have a special dedication or would you like to use our, um, we, we, we use, we'll use yours. Okay. Which is by the power and truth of this practice, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness may all be free from sorrow and the causes of sorrow may all never be separated from the sacred happiness, which is without sorrow. And may all live in equanimity without too much attachment or too much aversion, believing in the equality of all that lives. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Dorothy. Dorothy. Yeah, thank you. Be well. Be well, everyone. Thanks, Dorothy. You're welcome. Thank you so much. You. Take good care. Thanks, Dorothy. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks for visiting. Come back. Yeah, it was tricky, Dorothy, to detach from all those thoughts. I was looking at this, and I couldn't help but, you know, thinking about the color, where it came from, who, which student <laughs> gave me this face as a present, <laughs> you know, all that stuff. And, uh -huh. Yeah, 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 visual. It seems like visual is much harder to mm -hmm. close mm -hmm. down the stories on. Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. And and we don't have to close them down. We just we just see them for what they are. Do you know? We don't have to uh, try to stop thinking. That's well, what. That's how the mind functions, right? Yeah. It's just that they're. Uh, it's. It's not the deepest truth, mm -hmm. right? Anyway. Okay, have a good day. Right, have so a good rest of the day. day. Yeah. You too. Sunshine. All right, yeah. take care. Bye bye. Bye. All right. See you, everyone. Have a good week. See you either Wednesday or next Sunday. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.